Get those handkerchiefs ready and those tear ducts under control. Oh, God. Oh, God. Welcome to WatchMojo.com, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 tragic movie endings. Roll on one. For this list, we're looking at those movie endings that really dialed up our tolerance for heartache. While some of these movie endings seemed likely at the beginning of the film, we still weren't emotionally prepared for the soul-wrenching pain at the conclusion. Obviously, spoiler alerts all around. Number 10, American History X. Coming in here and poisoning my family's dinner with your Jewish, loving hippie bullshit. Even though it's a movie littered with Nazis and white supremacist rhetoric, deep down, most of us were still rooting for a happy ending. Who do you hate, Danny? I hate anyone that isn't white Protestant. Why? They're a burden to the advancement of the white race. We could see glimpses of one in the reformation of Edward Norton's character. As a former neo-Nazi who sees the error of his ways after a stint in prison for a hate crime. I lost three years of my life for your phony cause, but I am on to you now, you snake. Derek Vineyard witnesses his little brother following in his woefully misguided footsteps, so he attempts to intervene. I mean, I killed two guys, Danny. I killed them. And it didn't make me feel any different. And just when it seems like he might have broken through to Danny, a bullet breaks through his brother's chest and sends us all reeling. Number nine, Requiem for a Dream. You all right? Yeah, that was just a bad dream. It's pretty obvious that a movie about addiction is likely to subject viewers to harsh realities about the negative impact of dependence. My arm's just killing me. Let's have a look at it. <laughs> However, moviegoers are usually offered a reprieve by the end of such films. For example, with a protagonist that's turned the corner and changed his or her life for the better. I don't want to be running the streets my whole life with my sneakers all ripped up, my nose running down to my chin. But all I'm saying is we should take a little taste so we know how much to cut. But in Requiem for a Dream, not so much. <laughs> By the end of Darren Aronofsky's psychological drama, each of the four central characters has been consumed by their vices. You get a true sense of how destructive their addictions have become. <laughs> I, th I, th I think I need, I need to go to the hospital. Number eight, Philadelphia. Andrew Beckett was fired. You'll hear two explanations for why he was fired, ours and theirs. Take a film starring both Denzel Washington and Tom Hanks, and you already have a pretty good idea that your emotions are going to be brutally manipulated for the next two hours. It's everything around you is just the blood and the mud. I am divine. I am oblivion. In Philadelphia, Hanks plays a lawyer that's fired after his employer discovers he has AIDS and is gay. What happened to your face? I have AIDS. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. I, uh... As Andrew Beckett grows increasingly ill over the course of the film, audiences may have been privy to his impending fate, but that still doesn't dull the blow when he finally succumbs. His court victory ends up being bittersweet as he dies and is remembered by his family and friends in a gut-wrenching closing funeral. Don't turn your back on me. I don't wanna be Number seven. Seven. Who's in the box? Because I envy your normal life. Put the gun down, David. It seems that envy is my son. Oh, what's in the box? This well-constructed thriller was chock full of surprises, mainly of the gruesome variety. There was a man that had been force-fed to death, a guy in a bed that we all thought was long past dead, and a young lady that met a really painful end with a really painful sex toy. 
He wrote about the seven deadly sins. In spite of all this, audiences still weren't expecting the horrible twist director David Fincher saved for us at the end. It didn't work out. So, I took a souvenir. Her pretty head. In Seven, Brad Pitt and Morgan Freeman play detectives that have finally captured an elusive serial killer and are being led to the conclusion of his crimes, only to find out that he was still one step ahead of them. Oh, God! Oh, God! Oh! Number six, life is beautiful. The words Holocaust and heartwarming don't exactly go together. And yet for a moment, audiences were charmed by the story of a man who was trying to protect his son from the horrors of a concentration camp. In this tragic comedy drama, writer, director, star Roberto Benigni plays a Jewish-Italian bookshop owner whose family has been placed in one such camp. He attempts to convince his son that it's all an elaborate game, with a prize at the end. So after the Allied forces arrive to shut down the camp, we're given hope that they'll all be reunited and escape the ordeal together. But Guido's encounter with a guard cut that dream brutally short. Number five, one flew over the cuckoo's nest. You're no crazier than the average asshole out walking around on the streets, and that's it. In this 70s classic, Jack Nicholson plays an inmate at a mental institution named Randall Mac McMurphy, who manages to inject a sense of life and spirit of rebellion into a group of his fellow patients. No, 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 I'll show you some card tricks. You ain't seen the Spanish deck yet. That's 40% more torture. <laughs> <laughs> Throughout the course of the film, he butts heads with the remarkably unlikable Nurse Ratchet on multiple occasions, undermining her authority whenever he gets the opportunity. I want that television set turned on right now! One night of hard partying is followed by a violent confrontation between Mac and Ratchet, and ultimately leads to Mac being lobotomized. He's then euthanized by one of the inmates he'd inspired to seek his own freedom. Number four, The Green Mile. He mustn't blame John. He couldn't help what happened. It was, he's just a force of nature. This is another one of those films where you hoped for the best in spite of your instincts. Take my hand, boss. You see for yourself. Michael Clark Duncan plays John Coffey, a man wrongfully convicted of the sexual assault and murder of two girls and facing execution. Mostly I'm tired of people being ugly to each other. The guards of the jail soon come to realize that Duncan's character is actually a gentle soul with an immense gift, and that he will likely die for someone else's crimes. A gift like that in the hands of a man to kill a child. Well, that's a very tender notion, but the man is on death row for the crime. When Coffey finally meets his fate, at his own request, we see how the destruction of his potential due to the world's evil and prejudices is truly the greatest tragedy. Well, on to. Number three, The Mist. What is it, Daddy? Mist? While this Stephen King horror adaptation may be a complete deviation from The Green Mile and King's original ending, it definitely doesn't skimp in the tragedy department. Assholes, you got that kid killed, and I got a butt on me! When a dangerous mist traps a group of townspeople in a local grocery store, they are beset by unearthly creatures and forced to fight for their lives. Sally, <laughs> look out! After lasting the night, a small number of survivors, including the film's protagonist and his son, decide to make a run for it and drive to safety. My land cruiser can hold eight people. I say we drive south as far as the fuel takes us and try to get clear of this mist. 
But when their vehicle runs out of gas, they decide it'd be best to just end it all. After killing his son and the rest of the group, David Drayton emerges to find out that help was literally right outside their door the whole time. Number two, leaving Las Vegas. I thought I'd move out to Las Vegas. Back before moviegoers were introduced to Nick Cage's wackier roles, he turned in this Oscar-winning performance as an alcoholic with a death wish. I came here to drink myself to death. As Ben Sanderson, a screenwriter who has decided to drink himself to death in Las Vegas, he befriends and falls in love with a prostitute named Sarah, played by Elizabeth Shue. The two bond, while Ben slowly delves deeper into the pits of his alcoholism. Whoops! <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> As a final farewell, Ben and Sarah share moments of a romance never fully realized. You my angel. <laughs> I'm right here. After which he eventually succumbs to his disease. Before we unveil our top pick, here are a few honorable mentions. That was perfect. I'll never let go. I promise. You gotta tell him! Silent Green is people! Number one, Million Dollar Baby. I was on the undercard. I won my fight too. Maggie Fitzgerald? Well, Maggie Fitzgerald, what's up? In this sports drama, Hilary Swank plays Maggie Fitzgerald, an ambitious waitress who convinces a crotchety but skilled trainer to aid her in her dream of becoming a professional boxer. Thought you might be interested in training me. I don't train girls. Maybe you should. People see me fat say I'm pretty tough. Girly, tough ain't enough. As Maggie quickly moves up the ranks in her division, the two develop a bond similar to that of father and daughter. <laughs> and everything seems to go swimmingly for the most part. That is, until a sucker punch in the ring leads to her paralysis. <laughs> It's not a fate Maggie can accept, and she pleads with Frankie to put her out of her misery, which he eventually does. He gave her a single shot. It was enough adrenaline to do the job a few times over. He didn't want her going through this again. Do you agree with our list? What do you think is the most tragic movie ending? For more entertaining top 10s published every day, be sure to subscribe to WatchMojo.com.